Praise the Lord and welcome to the Apostolic Church of God, empowered by the word. As I say every week, I'm here with just a couple of my friends who have crashed my house to hang out with me uh, and study the word of God. Uh, but in all seriousness, this is God's house. Uh, and we are all God's children, and that's why it can be whoever's house we want it to be, because we're always welcome in the house of the Lord. And I just thank God for each and every one of you who are studying with us online, and certainly all of your wonderful and lovely faces. As the weather continues to fluctuate, uh, I don't know if to put on swimming trunks or a fur coat, but uh, I guess we'll figure it out in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I'm happy to see Antoinette and Ramel and Berdina and Evangelist Jones and uh, all of you who are online. And uh, certainly we give God praise for our pastor, Dr. Brazier, who celebrated his birthday on Sunday. You know, I, I know this is an active bunch. They were working out this morning, and so they probably were at the uh, marathon on Sunday, so you all missed Pastor's birthday, but uh, but we're just glad to see you and glad that you're here with us. Uh, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So the Bible tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So if you're hungry for the word, somebody shout, let's eat. eat. God, we are thankful today that you've allowed us to go on this journey to Easter. We thank you that you have taught us so many things in your word about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And as we wrap up our study today, we just pray that you will continue to feed our spirits and feed our minds that we may grow in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can gather together in person and online and get the same word at the same time. And even if we weren't able to be uh, available at 11 o'clock, we can watch this uh, at any time we choose. And so we just thank you for the day and age in which we live. We pray for those families in Mississippi, those families uh, in Tennessee, Lord, and elsewhere that are experiencing hardship uh, and trauma from the life that we now live. And we just pray that you would open up our hearts and minds, that we will receive your word and may it bring forth fruit 100 fold. We ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Come on in. Come on in. And so we are concluding our study, the journey to Easter. And we're going to conclude on the resurrection. We went from the incarnation, becoming flesh, to the resurrection. So the same body he in flesh, the Son of God, now is going to be the body that raises up uh, from the dead. Uh, and so before I forget, because I know some people leave after uh, we do the altar call, I uh, just want to remind everyone who is worshiping online that next Tuesday, because we will be in our Holy Week consecration, we're going to have a prayer and anointing service on that Tuesday during that daytime or hour. So uh, if you're not able to make it out on Friday night and you want to be a part of the Holy Week services and programming, please come join us in person on next Tuesday from 11 until noon, like we always do. Uh, and we'll make sure that you get out on time. Now, let's start with the significance of the resurrection. And in speaking about the nature of the resurrection, Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology states, and I quote, the resurrection of Christ had a threefold significance. It constituted a declaration of the father that the last enemy had been vanquished the penalty paid and the condition on which life was promised met. It symbolized what was destined to happen to the members of Christ, mystical body in their justification, spiritual birth and future blessed resurrection. It also connected instrumentally with their justification, regeneration and final resurrection, end quote. Now, what does all that mean, <laughs> right? There is a threefold significance to Jesus's resurrection. That's what Burkhoff is saying. One, it was a declaration of victory over sin and death. When Jesus got up from the grave, it was God the Father declaring victory over sin and death. Remember, up to that point, sin and death had been his arch nemesis. 
Because when Adam sinned in the garden, we learned that sin and death entered into creation. And so God had to send Jesus to defeat sin and death in our lives, in, in human experience. And so when Jesus raised from the dead, that was God saying, ha ha, I get the last laugh. The joke's not on me. The joke's on you because I have all power. Number two, Burkhoff tells us it was a demonstration of what will happen in the life of every believer because Jesus is the son of God in his divinity and the son of man in his humanity because his body got up. It gives me hope that my body will get up. It lets me know that I can, as a human being, be in right standing with God and that because of his resurrection, I look forward to the time that I, too, will join with him in that new humanity. Right. All right. And then number three, it is the means his resurrection is the means by which believers are justified, born again and will be resurrected. So it is not just a declaration of victory. It's just not a demonstration of what will be in my life, but it is also the instrument. It is the means that God achieved my salvation because Jesus died for my sins. He rose up so that I could rise up. If he doesn't rise from the dead, I'm forgiven, but I'm still a dead man. <laughs> All right. It is only because he raised the newness of life, Romans 6, that I can be spiritually born again, right? Because he sends the spirit back to me in order to live inside me. And he had to get up from the grave to send the spirit back. All right. So let's unpack this a little bit. I don't know how much we're going to get through, but you got the notes. So number one, Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Sister Martha, Margaret, I see you online. Matthew 28, 1 through 10 says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance or face was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified, but he is not here. For he is risen as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, it's always breaking news. Jesus met them saying, all hell. <laughs> and they came and beheld him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brothers that they go into Galilee and there they shall see me. So following Jesus's death and burial on Friday, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, uh, went to visit Jesus's tomb early Sunday morning. So the Sabbath is over. The daylight has come. It's early part of the morning. So now the women can go out because they want to go see the place where Jesus's body is in state. But as they are going there, there is this great earthquake that takes place. And the guards, because they put guards there at the tomb of Jesus to make sure the disciples didn't come and steal his body, to make sure uh, that he wasn't in a deep sleep and he woke up after having his entrails opened up and being stabbed in the side and all that stuff, but they still think the man somehow uh, did like John Wick 
uh, and was able to just make it out with his intestines and stuff hanging out. But, but you know, he, he beat up two guards, uh, rolled away a big old stone from the mouth of the cave. So they put these guards there and they were so scared, they just passed out, oh, you know. And then the angel rolled the stone away. And so both Marys, Mary, Mary, see, it was, it was Mary, Mary before Mary, Mary showed up. And they're like, what in the world is going on? Because there's this messenger there, an angel of God who is there in white raiment, an imposing, terrifying figure that's standing before them. And he says, now y'all don't be afraid. They passed out these Roman soldiers, but I don't want you all to be afraid because I got good news for you. Jesus is risen from the dead as he said. So Jesus foretold that he was going to get up from the grave. So Mary and Mary, y'all should not be surprised by what I'm sharing with you because he already told you about this. But here's what I want you to do. Don't take my word for it. Y'all came to see the tomb. Well, go on in there and take a look. Get your iPhone and your Android out and take all the selfies you want to take and then post them on your social media pages because he ain't up in there. So go inspect. Look, his body is not there. So don't you get his body is not there. The tomb is empty. The guards are out asleep. The tombstone is rolled away and his body is missing. And he says, now, here's what I want you all to do. Go tell Peter and the other disciples that the master wants to meet them in Galilee. So they're excited. They're confused. They're perplexed. They have a range of emotions taking place in their life. But they're going with excitement to tell the apostles his body gone. <laughs> Some angel appeared to us and told us. And as they're going, they run into Jesus himself. Now, since this is Women History Month, I'll throw this one in for free. It is unusual that women would be given such a prominent position in the literature of that day. One of the things that the folks who are far smarter than me always point out that it would actually discredit Jesus's resurrection to highlight the testimony of two women. But the first to see him and to be aware of his resurrection and to spread his news are not the men of a patriarchal society, but it is the women who are the first preachers, if you will, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and so you can clap this Women History Month. Now, I don't know if we got a Man History Month, Brother Williams, but we're going to have to work on that. We're going to put a petition on Obama.com and, uh, and see if that works. Change.org, I think that's what it is. And so they see him and they fall at his feet. It's not by accident. Yes, it's an act of worship, but it wasn't a ghost. See, see what Matthew wants us to understand is they didn't see a ghost. They didn't eat mushroom omelet for breakfast and they gave them some bad mushrooms and they omelets. They touched his feet. There was a human body in front of them, the man, Jesus Christ, and they worshiped him. And then he shared with them, I need for you all to go tell them. But it's not just he missing now. See, before, as we went to the tomb, he went there. We saw an angel. But now we went to the tomb. We saw an angel and we touched him. We talked to him. The one that cast all the demons out of Mary Magdalene and the Mary, uh, mother of James and Joseph, who were some of his uh, followers, they are eyewitnesses. They know it was the same person that was teaching and healing and doing miracles. It was the same person that was on the cross. And it was the same person who was before them at that moment. So when they went to the apostles, they were coming with 
verified evidence. So I want you to understand. And this happened on what day of the week? Come on now, wait, come on class now, all right? We're gonna send y'all back to the remedial. You know, you graduate high school and then they put you in a remedial class in college. Well, they do us anyway. I don't know what they do with the other folk. First day of the week is when Jesus got up from the grave. That's important. You got to remember this. What day of the week did Jesus rise from the dead? The first day of the week. All right, let's keep the train moving. Number two, Jesus was seen by over 500 people after his resurrection. Sister Lisa, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the 12. And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present day. But some are falling asleep. They did. After that, he was seen of James then of all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, when we get to chapter 15, we know Paul is writing to some of his troubled children uh, in Corinth, right? They, they gave him fits. And so in chapter 15, he wants them to understand the gospel that he preaches. He's been talking about this dichotomy between the wisdom of the world and the foolishness of the cross, right? That I didn't come to you preaching Socratic and Aristotelian methods, right? I didn't come with Greek oratory to show you how great a speaker I was. I came to you with the simplicity, the foolishness, the weakness of the gospel. Now he's telling us what that gospel is. And according to Paul, the gospel has four critical elements. Number one, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. As the scriptures predicted, Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, right? So the scriptures foretold us 700 years earlier. We could go further back than that. Genesis 3.15, which we always call the first gospel, the seed of the woman, or bruise the head of the serpent. All right. So 700 plus years before Christ died, Isaiah told us in Isaiah 53 that he was going to suffer for our sins. So that's the gospel. Number two, Jesus was buried. We talked about this last week. It's important to be buried because that's how you know the person is dead. Right. You won't see folk cry when that, that casket start going in that ground. That's when stuff settle. You know, you still hoping uh, Jimmy will get out that casket. But but when they lower that thing into the ground, that, that's when you know it's over. Like ain't, ain't no coming back from this, barring an act from God, of course. But generally speaking, that's the finality. When you put them in the ground, and when they put Jesus in that tomb, that was it. He was buried. He was confirmed dead. He had a certificate with the medical examiner in Jerusalem. Number three, Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day as the scriptures predicted. Notice Paul keeps saying, as it was written, as the scriptures foretold, that he was crucified, like the Bible said, and he rose from the dead on the third day, as the Bible said. You think he's trying to get us to think something about the Bible? That we can trust it. That is true. That is trustworthy. That's why our whole theme is truth to trust. Because the truth is in the scripture, and if we're going to trust any book, in this world, in this life, it has to be the scriptures because the scriptures are the only book or is the only book that has confirmation of delivering on its promises. It can tell you in advance what's going to happen and then we get verified evidence that is going to happen. Number four, 
Sister Peggy, Jesus was seen by over 500 people after his resurrection during the 40 days he remained on earth. So not only did he get up, but they didn't keep Jesus in hiding. All right, he, he alive now, so no, we're going to get him a stash house uh, and, and keep him out. We're going to send him to the wilderness and we're going to go and bring him food to protect him. No, he showed himself publicly. He was seen by over 500 people. That 500 people at one time. So this was not no little small meeting like, you know, our brothers and sisters in China that have to have service behind closed doors and, and pray that the government doesn't kick their door in and arrest all of them for having church illegally in their country. No, this was in the open. And it says that some of those people in the time of the Corinthians, when he wrote this letter, are alive today. So Paul said, you don't even have to believe what I'm telling you. Go and talk to Billy. Go talk to Susan because they were there and they would say, yes, I saw him. So he so if you want verifiable evidence, 500 people won't do. We got 500 people plus who said they saw Jesus, but we still don't believe it. We, we don't trust the evidence, but one person say somebody did this and we lock them up and we throw away the key. We judge them on Twitter without the facts coming out. But here we have 500 verified and we got a man talking about all this who couldn't stand Jesus or the church. But that's why he said, and last of all, he appeared to me like somebody born out of due time. I wasn't even supposed to be here, but he, he brought me in. He used me to let you know that he is alive and well. All right. Number three, Jesus's resurrection is the key to our salvation. We jumped into this with, um, with our theologian, uh, but we're going to drill down on the biblical level now. First Corinthians 15, 12, Sister Crystal, it says, now if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are also false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep are dead in Christ are perished. So now again, the, the Corinthians is his problem, kids. So now he already dealt with the gospel. We're in the same chapter. Now he's going to where he really wants to get. But he first had to say and give evidence of the resurrection of Christ with 500 witnesses. So after this, he has said, now why y'all saying ain't no resurrection from the dead? Why is it that you all are going around in your church services saying the dead do not rise? It's partly due to their Greco-Roman background. We know, you know, that Plato and Socrates and all of them saw the body as evil and really the soul would continue on. And so you had to separate soul from body because soul was the true self and all, all of that kind of stuff that we're not going to get into because it don't mean nothing to us. But he says that you all don't believe in the resurrection. So I had to give you the critical elements of the gospel in order to talk about this subject matter. And he says, despite the gospel that he preached, which included the bodily resurrection of the dead, they doubted it. They couldn't get past their social formation. See, one of the things about accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ is our education. And we're Western civilization just as they are. 
In fact, they form us. They form us because we are an extension of Western civilization. So we think like the Corinthians, we think like the Ephesians, we think like the Philippians because we are informed by Greece and Rome. We got an eagle on our flag <laughs> here in the state of Illinois. And so, and so when we are educated to think rational only, to think empirical evidence only, then that's why Paul says the gospel is foolishness to them that are wise. That we are so intellectual that we don't allow God the space to be who God is. Because if he doesn't fit in the logical intellectual box that we have constructed, because in our minds, and generally speaking, it is a biological impossibility that the dead can raise. But God is not restricted to the laws of nature. What makes God God, as I always tell you, is that he can do whatever he wants to do. That's what distinguishes him from everybody else is that what is impossible for us is possible with God or else he's not God. Now, that's a logical conclusion that we're walking out here. All right. So, so Paul said that there were several problems with this position if there's no resurrection of the dead. He said, now, I want you all to think this out logically because we don't want to think supernaturally. Fine. So let's deal with Greek logic. We're going to do a logical conclusion. He says, number one, Jesus cannot have risen from the dead. If the dead don't rise, Paul starts with logical conclusion. Jesus hasn't risen because he was dead. And if the dead don't rise, Jesus didn't rise. All right, I got it. I got it. He then says, if Jesus didn't rise, then my preaching is useless. Because I'm out here running my big mouth saying he got up <laughs> from the grave. But if he did not get up from the grave, then I'm wasting my time. I'm being stoned for no reason. I'm being beat for no reason. I'm being chased out of cities for no reason. I'm experiencing hunger and starvation for no reason. I'm being shipwrecked and, and bitten by snakes for no reason. Because I'm doing all of this for the message of the gospel. I'm out here as a messenger and a herald of the good news that Jesus is alive and well, but y'all said he, he, the dead don't rise. So he didn't get up. So I'm out here wasting my time. He says, if I'm out here preaching in vain, then your faith is useless because you still in sin. Because you believe the worthless message that I preached. And so you are wasting your time believing in someone who did not get up from the dead, which means you still in sin. You still in trouble. <laughs> you still have a problem with the creator because his wrath has been revealed against all unrighteousness. All right. And if you are still in your sins, then that means, Paul says, I'm a false witness because I'm out here lying on God. So I'm not only preaching a useless message and wasting my time, but I'm out here lying, saying God did something he didn't even do. Now, y'all don't put me in trouble, <laughs> right? Because I'm lying on God. It's one thing to disobey God. It's one thing to rebel against God. But now I'm lying on him directly. I'm using his name disrespectfully, right? I am blaspheming God saying he did something that he didn't even do. Then he says, finally, those believers who have died in Christ are ruined because their bodies are not coming back alive. He sent all the saints that are now asleep, a euphemism for death. We call them sleep because sleep people get up. Dead people don't get up. So when the Bible uses the word sleep, it's intentional. Just like Jesus said about Lazarus. Oh, he just sleeping. 
Now he four days dead. He's stinking. Beetles and maggots starting to form in him. Right. His flesh is beginning to rot. It's stinky up in there. The, the myrrh and aloe is wearing out. We can smell it now. Roll that stone back because he was just sleeping. Why? Because sleep people get up. So those who are asleep in Christ, their bodies are dead. We're not stupid, but their bodies are just sleeping. We know their soul is with God in heaven because absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But their bodies are just taking a long nap. <laughs> It's a long one, a nice, good one. I wish I could get a nice nap every now and then. I wake up tired all the time. But 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 he says that they are in a ruined condition because those bodies won't come back. But he is risen from the dead. That's why his resurrection becomes the source of our salvation. Because we are not in our sins and our bodies are going to raise up from the dead. So when Burkhoff did his little theological talk, this is Paul giving it to us in more preacher language, that his resurrection made our salvation possible. Not just our spiritual salvation, but our bodily salvation. All right, let's keep the train moving, Sister Antoinette. Number four, Jesus's resurrection secured his eternal priesthood. Are you with me? Are you with me? All right. So I'll make sure I know we've been drilling down hard for a couple of months. Jesus resurrection secured his eternal priesthood. Hebrews five, seven through 10 says who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared or reverenced, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author, the initiator of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So now, Whoever wrote Hebrews, we're not sure, a lot of names out there, but we don't know, is talking about Jesus being better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. And now he's showing that he is better than Aaron because Jesus' high priestly ministry was important for our salvation, right? There, there's so much packed into one person. That's why we need the Old Testament. And the people who try to throw the Old Testament away have no idea what you would be missing. You would not understand the significance and the import of Jesus's life and ministry without the Old Testament, because that gives us the foundation. It's like you can't do calculus and algebra until you can add, subtract, multiply and divide. The Old Testament is all of that. The New Testament is the calculus and the algebra and the geometry, but you don't get to do that unless you understand the Old Testament. All right. So he says, the author, that during Jesus's suffering on the cross, he prayed to God with a loud voice and extreme weeping to rescue him from death. So while he's on the cross, Jesus's concern is what's going to happen to his body after his death because once he dies Jesus of Nazareth is trusting the father to bring that body back to life you have to understand this he's the son of God in his divinity he's the son of man in his humanity and his humanity had to trust in the father you understand what I'm saying here Thank you. And so he is crying out to the father because he know he's dying. He's hanging on the cross. His insides are hanging out. They done beat him up real bad. He's, he's trying to grasp of breath because the way they got him hanging, if he doesn't pull himself up on those nails, he's going to suffocate. But every time he pulls himself up, he's ripping into the, the nails in between there, not in his hands, but in, in between that wrist bone. If you put your wrist and finger there, you'll feel there's, there's a little dip that you can nail through. 
and those bones will hold that nail in place. All right. And so somebody says, you're <laughs> and so what happened now is he's crying in his final moments. Lord, bring this body back to life. That's his prayer, his cry, his plea, just like ours. Well, we, we're not looking forward to dying no time soon, but we are praying that we get up from the grave by the grace and mercy of God. And so note that the writer says that God heard Jesus's prayer because Jesus had a deep reverence for God. That is, Jesus was righteous. God answered Jesus's prayer because Jesus had a reverence for the father. He lived a life that was pleasing to God. So when we read the book of Proverbs and we see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it is not just talking about, ooh, boogeyman God. No, it's talking about a reverence, a respect for God that causes you to live holy and follow the principles of Scripture. Because if I reverence God, I'm going to do what you ask me to do. I reverence my parents when I do what they ask me to do. I could say I love them all day long, but if I disrespect and disobey them, then somebody say he don't even respect his parents. But my respect is demonstrated in my obedience and my loyalty to you. And so God's response to Jesus's reverence for him was to raise him from the dead. That's what substantiates, and I'll talk about this a little more in a moment, his righteousness. Because God would not raise a wicked person back to life. He only raises those who live upright before him. And so what Jesus did in his crying out in faith to the father was honored by the father because Jesus lived a godly life. So, Jesus' obedient suffering qualified him to be the perfect high priest that the father always wanted. Now, here's what this Hebrew writer, I was going to call him scholar because he writes very scholarly, is helping us understand that Jesus was the high priest that God always wanted. But he had to have an Aaron so we would understand Jesus. If we don't have Aaron, the high priest, and all of his sons, then what Jesus did at Calvary has no significance to us. Because the priesthood was instituted, particularly the high priest, only one person out of an entire nation could go before God. And he could only do it one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And some of you all heard me on Courageous Prayer. I was talking about Passover being one of the three festivals. The other one was another one was the Day of Atonement. And so and so on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had to first offer a sacrifice for his own sins because he's a sinner. Then he had to put on clothes and go and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. <laughs> And he would go into the most holy place or the holy of holies. And there at the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, the cover called the mercy seat, where the two angels are bowing down to God, the mercy seat, he would sprinkle blood at the place of mercy. And then he would come back out. And then the people would, God would cover their sins for that year. So whole year sins one man get to go in and cover all those sins until the real high priest showed up. Until the real high priest. So when Jesus is on the cross, he's the high priest and the sacrifice, both at the same time. So he's hanging as the lamb of God, uh, John the baptizer, that take away the sins of the world and he is the high priest who is offering up the sacrifice, not on behalf of a nation, but on behalf of all humanity. Everybody's sin, not just what uh, one group of two, three, four, five, five million people did over a year, but from Adam, 
Paul says to everybody else. And if the Lord don't come in the next 200 years, I don't think you I will be here. Everybody who's sinning up to the end, that one sacrifice covered their sins. So he's the high priest that God always wanted. His obedient suffering also made him the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys. The problem with the sacrificial system is it got you another year of past, but it never saved you. You still had a sin nature. That's why Aaron or Phinehas or Eleazar and the rest of them that kept coming to be the high priest had to keep going in because we was in bad shape. We had a sin nature. So we're going to keep on and keep on and keep on. But Jesus died not just for our sins to be covered, but to be forgiven, to be washed away and for us to be given a new nature when the Holy Spirit comes to live in our lives. And so Jesus's obedient suffering, I'm just following the Bible, also caused God to designate him an eternal high priest after the pattern of Melchizedek. So again, he was the priest, high priest that God always wanted. Aaron died. So his son had to succeed him. That son died, so he had to succeed him. So all of these lineage of Aaron are dying and being replaced. And they have to keep on offering a sacrifice year after year. But Jesus is not of the tribe of Levi. So he is not a descendant of Aaron. He is of the tribe of Judah. He is a descendant of David. And so in order for God, who has to follow his rules and his protocols to allow Jesus to serve as high priest, he had to take us back to the time when Abraham went and delivered his nephew Lot from the five kings that had taken him hostage. And on his way back from his victory, Abraham met a man by the name of Melchizedek, who was the priest and king of Salem, of peace. Salem means peace. And so he offered tithes unto him. And so we don't know where Melchizedek came from. We have no record of his birth or his death. So Melchizedek has given us a pattern. He has given us a prototype for God to follow that allows Jesus to be king and priest. This is why I say, if you don't read the Old Testament, you will have no idea what the author of Hebrews means by Melchizedek, that he was the king of Salem. David was the king of Jerusalem. He was, Jesus is the king and the priest after the order, old King James Version, or more sensible after the pattern of Melchizedek, because as the eternal son of God, he has no beginning or end. Yet he is king and priest of Jerusalem. Y'all with me or no? All right. All right. Y'all got a little too quiet in here for a minute. I had to make sure. All right. Let's keep it moving. We're losing time. Number five, Jesus's resurrection confirmed his claim to be God's son. Romans one, Sister Nettie says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which is made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So now Paul is saying he's opening his letter here to the Romans and he's saying that I am writing as an apostle of the good news concerning Jesus Christ of the lineage of David, writing to Romans, to a people who are citizens of the world power. So I have to write to them forcefully. I have to appeal 
to that superpower. You know, they say Americans, when we go abroad, we we command respect. We, we just have this aura about us. Even those of us of darker hue, even though we know the realities of the social construct of this nation, when we go outside, people don't see us as Negroes. They see us as Americans. And as Americans, we command a certain respect, a certain entitlement. We're used to a certain quality of life, be it less than our counterparts. And so when Paul is writing to the Romans, he's saying of the seed of David, he's appealing to the empire in them because Jesus is the descendant of the prototype king. He is the descendant of the king whose loins would give birth to the Messiah, who would have an everlasting kingdom, whose reign would never end. So he's appealing to that in his humanity. But then he says, but he was proven to be the son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. So when he got up from the grave, it confirmed that he was who he said he was all along, the son of God in divinity. He was back to life. And so when Matthew 28 says all power is given to me on heaven and on earth. In my humanity now, I've come back to life and now not just in my divinity and my godness, but in my humanity, I'm the king of heaven and earth. Angels must bow and kneel to this human being. You understand? So he's proven by his resurrection to be the son of God. He's the one. He's the one that got up from the grave and I'll deal with this because I have to teach Easter uh, Sunday in Sunday morning Bible study. So you, you get a little preview of that. The fact that he got up from the grave proves who he is. It affirms his godness, his holy life, but it affirms his godness. All right, let's keep it moving. Number Six, Sister Anna, the early church met on the day of Jesus's resurrection, Acts 27. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. So I want I just want to highlight one thing. The answer question is why we have church on Sunday. You can find out. We just read why we have church on Sunday. Is I told you and I asked this class for the quiz I'm about to give again. What day did Jesus rise from the dead? The first day of the week. What day did Paul meet with the saints in Troas? The first day of the week. They met on the first day of the week because that is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, we know that the Jewish faith met on the Sabbath day, which would be that Saturday, Friday night into Saturday night, because they go from six to six or sundown to sun up. But the saints, the church, Sabbath, if you will, is the day that Jesus got up. So I want you to understand this and, and get this now. This is historical evidence that they changed the day they met. One, they were still connected to the temple worship. We, we know that. But also they chose the day that Jesus got up from the grave. You have to understand this. It speaks to the reality of it that a people would gather together for worship on a day that we claim Jesus's body was raised from the dead. So when they ask you now, how come y'all don't worship on the Sabbath day? We do worship on the Sabbath day. Sabbath just means holy, sacred. <laughs> what for us as believers in Jesus Christ is we meet on the day he got up. They were told not to work on the Sabbath day, 
but we meet, which would be our Sunday, but we meet on Sunday. I'm sorry, on that Saturday. We meet on Sunday because for us, that is a holy day. And they met to break bread. We Now, obviously, we believe that is the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, which we will have not this Sunday, but next Sunday. So I hope you're here on Easter Resurrection Sunday. But also we know from Corinthians that their communion was part of a broader meal called a love feast. So they sat down and had dinner together, potlucks or whatever. And they, as a part of that, they would have Holy Communion. So you don't just have to have a cracker and a cup of wine or grape juice. You can have a meal. But then when it comes time that we're going to remember the Lord's death, that's what communion is about. Remember his death until he comes. We then also as a part of our fellowship and communion with each other, celebrate the Lord's Supper that he had with his disciples, because that is a reminder that he's coming back. He died, but he's coming back. All right. Keep, are you with me? You got that. We clear that we have service on Sunday because that's the day, that's the first day of the week. And that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So, so we can answer that question now. And folk want to argue us down why y'all do it on Sunday and not Saturday or Friday, Saturday is because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And this is what the early church practiced. This is what the early church practice. We're talking A.D. 34, 35, 40. All right. We didn't start this uh, when uh, A.D. 340, A.D. 40, A.D. 33, 35. The church is already doing this and we have continued throughout history. All right. Finally, our last scripture. Well, we got a couple more. No, we do. Last one. The Holy Spirit's presence in our lives is evidence of Christ's resurrection. John 16, 7 says, nevertheless, Sister Ruby, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, we know this goes all the way back to John 14, 13, somewhere when Jesus like, you know what? It's been real. Uh, I have really enjoyed these three and a half years with y'all, but I got to go. <laughs> and they're like, what you talking about, Willis? You know, <laughs> he said, I got to go. I have to go to the cross but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I don't want your heart to be troubled. I don't want you to be dismayed, but I got to go. And he's saying here, it's for your good that I go away. And here's what I want. He didn't leave from there to heaven. He went to the cross and died. So hear me now. We process it logically. The only reason the Holy Spirit is in the earth, as we know it, living inside of believers, is because Jesus and the Father sent the Holy Spirit back. So if Jesus died and the Holy Spirit has made it here, then the logical conclusion is Jesus got up from the dead. <laughs> Are you following the logic here? You got me. All right. All right. If he didn't make it back to heaven, the Holy Spirit would not have made it back to earth. Now, I know y'all deep theologians. We know God is everywhere. We, we, that's not what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament. He left Saul and went on David. So we know that. We know the period of the judges. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he's able to kill a thousand of them with the jawbone of a donkey. We know the Holy Spirit was at work. In Genesis 1, the Spirit of the Lord hover, hovered over the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit is at work always through our human history because God is everywhere. All right? You call him omnipresent, all or everywhere present. But we're talking about the Holy Spirit living inside humans permanently, right? Permanently. And so Jesus said, I must 
go away or else he cannot come. And so if he went to the cross and he went in a tomb and the Holy Spirit is here, then my little fickle Chicago public school mind says that he must have made it up to heaven some way. He came back to life. So the fact that you and I have the Holy Spirit and Paul in Ephesians one says he is the down payment of our bodily resurrection. So the spirit living in my spirit is the down payment. It's the earnest payment. When you're buying a house, you don't give them the 100,000, 200,000, half a million, you know, y'all million dollar homes y'all got. Uh, you don't give them that all at once. You give them a down payment that is non-refundable that says, I am going to purchase this house so you can take it off the market. You can't take my earnest money and then still be trying to shop it. You know, some of us, you got somebody's money and they all, man, he give your money back. I got a better deal. No, bro, I gave you my money, man. What you mean? You sold my car. I got a new job. I got to get there. The Holy Spirit is a non-refundable deposit from God that affirms that Jesus rose from the dead. So we got eyewitnesses. We got women in Women History Month giving credibility to something that no man would accept their testimony on. We got the Holy Spirit, most importantly, down on the inside of us that lets us know this thing is real. That's what lets me know. If, if, if I don't, I'm still trying to figure out what the Bible mean. If I know I have the Holy Spirit, that's evidence. We talked about that, you know, I ain't gonna get in your debate. But how do you know you save? Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. That's what lets me know Jesus is alive and well because he's in me right now. So what's the big idea? Closing the shop. The resurrection of Christ is the pivotal event in God's program and that it confirmed Jesus's divinity and secured the spiritual and physical salvation of believers. It is the pivotal event, the resurrection of Christ. Next month, we're going to talk about the final frontier and how the cross of Christ is the final frontier of humanity. Everything, it was the last battle, all right? And that includes the death of Christ, but we'll talk about that more next month. But it was the pivotal moment in God's program. If Jesus doesn't get up, all hope is lost. You have to understand Satan and them were kicking it hard. For three days, they were partying. We got them. It's over. Cancel Christmas. And then there was an earthquake. <laughs> and the party pooper showed back up and said, oh, y'all got a party going on in here. Let me, let me get up in on this. He said, I don't think so. I got all power on heaven and earth. Here's the question. Do you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead? The bodily resurrection. I always talk to you about the historical bodily resurrection of Christ. This is not some concept, abstract, spiritual thing. We're talking about a human body dead for three days came back to life. That's what I'm asking. Do you believe the bodily resurrection. All right. All right, they're trying to have church. <laughs> it's all right to praise them. Here's my challenge. For those of you who are still not persuaded or, or, or you know, need to be reinforced, review the evidence we just covered and ask yourself, is it more likely than not that Jesus is alive today? I want you to go back over those scriptures and just ask yourself, is it more likely than not, right? To win an election, you need 50% plus 0.1. If I get 50.1% of the vote, 
that's more likely than not. In courtroom, civil cases, they call that a preponderance of the evidence. Doesn't mean there is not some questions and concerns, but is it more likely than not? That, that's my question today. Is it more likely than not to you? So go back and look, read, pray to God to give you a better understanding of understanding this whole thing we call the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And there may be someone here today who has not given their life to Christ. As our baptismal committee comes forward, we want to extend to you a chance to give your life to Jesus, to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, to have the hope of the expectation of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If you are here, won't you come? I know you're here. I can feel you are here. And you keep coming week after week. And there's something, more importantly, someone who keeps drawing you back. And that's because God is calling you. Better way, he is summoning you. He's inviting you to have a personal relationship with him. And so we want you to be a part of this great experience that we call life in Christ. We, we want you to know in church language that your calling and election is sure, that you are right with God, that you have a right relationship with him, that you are in right standing with him so that when Jesus comes back, whether you are alive or dead, that you will go with him back to heaven. That, that, that's the promise of the resurrection. That's what our hope is in, is that what God did for Jesus one day, he's going to do for us. And so we have to have him now in order to experience the resurrection later. And this is your opportunity. This is your time to say, I believe in Christ. I believe that God raised him for the dead. And for those of you who are online, worshiping and studying with us, this same invitation is extended to you to put your faith and your confidence, not in the dead Jesus, but in the resurrected Jesus, because we serve the true and living God. And this is your chance to say yes. The information is on your screen. It tells you how to get in contact with us to let us know that you have put your trust in Jesus, because all you got to do is believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth that Jesus is God's son and Jesus is Lord. If you believe that on today, the Bible says you are saved and now you just got to find a church home so that you can understand more and more of this faith to which you now belong. Let us pray. God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the power of the resurrection and for keeping your promise to Jesus, your son, who came into this world to die for our sins as we read that he cried out to you with tears and weeping, you affirmed his faith and you affirmed his divinity and you affirmed his holy life when you raised him from the dead by your power. And so now, Lord, we pray that all who have given their lives to you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead will live in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that that same power that raised him from the dead will raise us from the dead on the day that he comes to rapture the saints of God. So, Lord, bless them, touch them, fill them with your Holy Spirit, and bless them, Lord, to walk in the newness of life that you've called them to. And we'll give your name the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Uh, it is now offering time at the Apostolic Church of God. And so we want you to please give as God has prospered you. We are 100% tithers and we are 100% givers because we believe in not showing up to God empty handed. And after we just talked about all he did for us in raising Jesus from the dead, uh, we need to get more baskets like we did on Sunday. You know, we need to get 12 more baskets to bring out here because uh, we're going to make it happen. Amen. We're going to make it happen with, with our tithes and our offerings. So give as God has pressed, prospered you. I'm joking, but, but I am serious that we always want to show our appreciation to God 
with the little we have or with the much that we have. We give according to our ability. That's all he asks. Give according to your ability and God will increase. He gives seed to the sower. He gives bread to the eater. If you don't do it the old fashioned way, you can do fancy stuff with the text to give. You can go to our website. Uh, you can scan the QR code uh, and God will bless you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for your word and for this opportunity to give back to you out of what you've already given to us, whether it's our tithe or our offering, we pray that you will multiply it 100 fold for the use of your kingdom, that you will return it back to us 100 fold. Bless the work of the ministry. Bless those who have the responsibility of stewarding these funds. And we pray that they will be used for kingdom impact, for souls to be saved and the people of God to be strengthened. And we give your name, the honor, glory and praise in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Uh, ushers, please come forward as they're coming. I got a few announcements. And so I'm going to go ahead and pull up my email so I get it right. Uh, one, don't forget to watch the question of truth. I don't know if you all saw either of the two broadcasts that we had, uh, whether that was the live television or our social media platforms. Uh, but go on there and check it out. Thank you. Because this one is about 15 or 20 minutes at most, uh, but I think you will find it interesting to hear what young adult Christians think, uh, and uh, that should inform how we engage them and how we deal with our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are growing up in the faith, and some of their perspectives are not necessarily what our perspectives were when we were growing up uh, in the church. Uh, also, don't forget uh, that we have Wednesday night Bible class on tomorrow at 7 o'clock p.m. in-house uh, and online. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we are doing our worship auxiliary recruitment fair. Uh, it is important that everybody serve in a ministry, a ministry. I think it's easier to pick a Sunday worship auxiliary because you come in a church on some Sunday anyway, even if you come once a month. Let that be the Sunday you serve too, uh, but but please join it. We we need help. We need more ushers. We need more security, more hospitality, more baptismal. And I'm gonna throw one in. It's not a Sunday morning, but we need more help even on Tuesday uh, with the daytimers ministry. Uh, they, I'm sure they would be happy. So if you don't come on Sundays for whatever reason, and you come on Tuesdays, then you got uh, uh, Brother Williams. You got. Uh, Sister Lutz, just check in with them and tell them we want to be a part of the daytimers ministry. And I'm sure they will be happy to have you uh, be a part. Also, uh, save the date for our joy of Easter, which is this Sunday. We only have one service. Everybody say one service. <laughs> That's going to be at 10, 15 a.m. So you can still come early, but I would not advise showing up at 1140 uh, or else you might as well just put your save seat sign where you are right now, because that's where you're going to be uh, on Sunday. So um, but the one service, we got J. Anthony Brown. Uh, you thought I was worth saving. So you came and, you know, you know, all that and our mass choir, so forth and so on. And then finally, don't forget that starting that Sunday, we begin our Holy Week consecration. Uh, we're going to fast Monday through Saturday, and you get to pick your fast. We put three in the consecration guide that you can download at our website. It got prayers for every day, scriptures for every day. You can journal. Uh, it tells you what's happening each uh, weeknight. There's something every night at 7 o'clock, uh, and I want you to tune in every night. I'm going to cancel my podcast uh, this week just so I can make sure I know what it is, but but I'll, just so I can tune in and be a part of this Holy Week consecration. So I'm going to cancel my podcast. I normally do. And so I want you all to chime in as well and make time each night at seven o'clock uh, to worship uh, with the saints of this uh, congregation. And so I think that's everything. Just a reminder, as I go ministers, we're in black next Tuesday. Uh, we don't have to wear robes, but we're in black next Tuesday, uh, but we're having as a part of that consecration week, we're going to have a prayer and anointing service in the second half hour of our one hour Bible class. So invite people who, you know, come out. 
and haven't been here. Uh, and we're going to pray with you and anoint you as a part of our Holy Week consecration, because I know some of you won't be able to come out on Friday night and we don't want you to miss out on the prayer. So may God bless you and keep you. See you next week. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the final frontier, which is the cross. All right. Thank you. Let's receive Sister Lutz. Reverend Hayes, when will you be teaching the Sunday Bible study? Easter. Easter. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure we weren't talking about next week. Let's give him a round of applause. Our dear beloved assistant pastor, Reverend Isaac Hayes.